So you're wondering how to lose weight if you're an emotional eater? Well, keep watching this video. I think I've got a lot of very helpful information for you. In this video, we'll cover what is an emotional eater, if you're one, and what kind of problems that could be causing for you. And then we'll cover the simple process of getting past your emotional eating. And yes, I promise you, there's hope. And last, I'll tell you how I got past my emotional eating problem and what you can do. What is an emotional eater? You guys saw me holding up the bag of M&Ms. Yeah, because this is my nemesis. That's why I'm holding up. An emotional eater is someone who deals with stress, anxiety, anger, sadness, grief, even joy through eating food. You eat food to deal with those emotions. You eat food to cope. And by the way, most of the people that I deal with are emotional eaters. In fact, most women are emotional eaters because we're emotional creatures. Most men are mindless eaters and that's a different video for a different day. An emotional eater is someone who's gonna turn to food and eat when they have something that comes up, okay? Anxiety, anger, stress, fear, feeling desperate, any of those emotions that you might feel, anything that happens throughout the day. If you've got a particularly stressful situation, if your son just got a DUI, or if you found out your husband is sleeping with a secretary, or even if you just got into a little fender bender, or your dog got off the leash and ran out in the middle of the road. All of those are emotional things that happen to us. Some of them more severe than others. And what do we do? We turn right to food to fill that void, to deal with that situation. We eat. It's funny to me when I think of a funeral, when I think of somebody dying, what does everybody do? Well, they bring over a casserole and I know why they're doing it. They're doing it as a nice gesture to provide food for you so you don't have to worry about making anything. And it's so nice to them, really. Nobody means it as a malicious act. They just do. They just bring over food and they bring over comfort food. You know, macaroni and cheese, casseroles, green bean casseroles with those little Funyuns on top and they're loaded down with just calories and crap and it's not gonna make you feel any better, but we eat it because we're dealing with the grief and the sadness of losing our loved one. But so many things can trigger emotional eating. So many situations can take place and you turn to food. I mean, we'll turn to food for any reason if we're being completely honest with ourselves. We will always seek out a reason to binge eat or a reason to eat in general. And sometimes you don't even know you're doing it. You don't mean to sabotage yourself. You don't mean to wreck your progress. You don't mean to do it, but it's so automatic. Some people emotionally eat when they're bored. That, it doesn't have to be a car wreck or a, or a DUI to get you to emotionally eat. Some people do it because they just simply don't have a lot going on. Maybe you're empty nester, maybe you're early retired. I know that my husband, when he first retired, he retired at 49 years old. He was a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And when he retired, he got pretty fat. I mean, he was already a little bit heavy coming out of work because his work was massively stressful when he left his job. And he was bored when he retired. He didn't have, I mean, his life for 27 years had been his company and he traveled extensively and he worked hard for almost three decades. And so when he retired, he was eating and he was telling me how his first wife got a bread maker and they would make loaf after loaf after loaf of homemade bread. He said, I ate so much homemade bread that I got, he gained 30 pounds just from eating bread all the time. And he was bored. He didn't know what he was gonna do with himself. He didn't have any other hobbies or anything else going on when he first retired. That might be you. Maybe you are uh, having sadness from your kids, your last child leaving for college. Maybe you miss your kids, you miss your grandkids. Maybe you've just experienced something traumatic. So a lot of us are emotional eaters and that's not a big deal. I don't wanna beat you up over that. I wanna release you of the shame and guilt. Understand? This is one of the biggest things we deal with on the Code Red Lifestyle is 
emotional eating because it just runs rampant. And plus, food is everywhere. It is everywhere. We are surrounded by tons and tons of food. Everywhere you turn, look, you go into Lowe's or Home Depot to get a doorknob. You've got Swedish fish and M&Ms right around you. I mean, it's everywhere. You can't go anywhere without a Coke or without, you know, some kind of a, a, a juice or something in a cooler. It's everywhere. So the deck is stacked against us in our society. So anytime we feel anything, any kind of unsettling feelings, anything that's going on that's unsettling in here, we turn to something that could temporarily take our minds off of it. Let me tell you my story, and it has to do with peanut M&Ms. That's why I got this. In fact, even when I was on my way over here to record this with you guys, I stopped at the store to pick up some props. And <laughs> I mean, it's been years since I've had some of these. And let me tell you why. When I lived in New York and I trained celebrities, I was so lonely. I didn't have a husband or a boyfriend or a partner for like seven years. And I, I miss my family so much. All my family lived back in Idaho and I missed them so much. I hardly got to see them because I was so broke that I could not fly across the country to see them. And they didn't have the money to come see me all the time in New York City. I didn't have a lot of friends because I mean, fellow New Yorkers, you'll know what I'm talking about. You live on the island of Manhattan, which I did, and a million people at the time on the island of Manhattan. So you're surrounded by people all the time when you're at coffee shops, on the subway, on the sidewalk, and you're constantly up against people, but you lack that connection. You don't have that connection to people. And I didn't have connection. I mean, I belonged to a church, but I didn't, wasn't really super active in church. And I was so incredibly lonely and I had such high anxiety. It was so difficult. My rent for my apartment was expensive and my rent for my gym was expensive. I didn't know if I was gonna have enough money for rent the next month. I lived literally month to month, sometimes week to week. If a client bought a training package for me, hallelujah, I was able to stay in New York another month. But I remember being so broke at one point going to the food bank to get food. I mean, I had a dog champ who was my black lab champ. He was with me. He lived with me in New York. My parents had overnighted me elk meat because I had no food. And I was down to my last package of elk meat and I gave it to my dog champ so that he could eat and I went hungry. So I really had a rough time in New York and I'll, you'll see pictures of me and I'm smiling and I'm happy, but I was dead broke and I was miserable and I was sad. So what did I do? I started eating M&Ms and I ate an entire pound of peanut M&Ms just like these every single night while I laid in bed. And you think about an entire pound, 16 ounces of peanut M&Ms laying in bed right before sleep. I mean, enormous amount of sugar that I was ingesting. I just can't believe it. I can't believe I did that. But what it would do is it would temporarily make me so uncomfortable. It would cause my stomach incredible pain, like this horrific cramping. I mean, I was getting these near toxic levels of sugar and it would temporarily caused me so much discomfort that I would temporarily forget about my anxiety and my sadness and my loneliness. And I would be able to fall asleep. And the next day I'd wake up and I'd do it all over again. So I understand emotional eating and I understand how difficult it is to live with that kind of crippling behavior. Before I go on in this video, I want to hear what you think. I don't know if you know this, but I read every single one of your comments in the comments section. And I would love to hear your story about emotional eating. Do you have kind of a story like mine where you were addicted to sugar and making yourself uncomfortable? What is your emotional eating story? Put it in the comment below and I can't wait to read it. Maybe when you grew up, you were a part of the clean your plate club. Remember that guys? I mean, some of the older generation, you'll know your parents told you, you are not getting up from this table unless you clean that plate. And you had to sit there at that table or maybe even you got spanked because you didn't clear your plate. You didn't eat everything on your plate. I definitely wasn't a part of the clean plate club in my household. My mom made incredible home cooked meals. She was a very, very good cook. And we used our venison and our wild game and our cougar and bear and different meat that we had to feed our family. 
And my mom just made do with such a small amount of food. She was amazing. So we were naturally very active girls. We worked on the farm. We had chickens and pigs and horses and cows. And we had, we grew our own hay. So there was never a problem with us finishing our plate in our household. That was never enforced. So when it comes to overcoming your emotional eating so you can lose weight, because yeah, your emotional eating is gonna hinder you from losing weight. You have to know your triggers. You have to find out and understand what makes you do this. And we offer an emotional eating course called What's Eating You. And it's a course that you can take. And part of that course, we teach you about this whole process. But the short version is knowing your triggers will help you identify when you are about to emotionally eat. So me, for example, I'll tell you my story. My triggers, taxes, firing an employee, any really anything to do with my accountant or money. That's why I hired a CFO so that he can deal with it. And I don't have to, but still those things are my top triggers. So now that we know our triggers, now what, what do you do? I'll tell you what I do when I know my triggers, I make sure that I either, I have a meeting with my accountant in my car or I go to his office. Uh, I make sure that if I'm dealing with an employee, situation, I've got something going on with an employee that's very, very stressful for me. I take that meeting out of the kitchen. I put safeguards in place to prevent me from emotional eating because I can see myself walked right into the kitchen. I, I can picture it in my mind. I walked right into the kitchen and like a zombie walked right up to the fridge, opened it up and just started eating. It didn't even taste good. I was just eating food. And what does that do? That gives you that uncomfortable feeling in your stomach. And for a temporary amount of time, it's going to get your mind off of what's going on. We're just dealing with our anxiety and it doesn't have to be this way. You've got to put safeguards in place. So my safeguard would be like for with a tax situation. I would have my CFO handle it. I know what it is that causes me the most anxiety and I stop it before it becomes a problem. And that's key for you. Another thing is you've got to clean out those cupboards because it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when you're going to emotionally eat. You are going to have that opportunity to binge. You are going to have that opportunity to give in. And if you are being triggered by your mother-in-law, as soon as your mother-in-law leaves, you're going to go right for that box of fruit loops. But if you don't keep the fruit loops in the house, you don't have to worry about turning to them because most of us are proximity eaters. We're probably not going to drive down to the 7-Eleven to go get something. We're just going to forget about it because it's not going to be right there in front of us. And I promise you, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when you will give in. That's why we don't keep sugar in our house. You can have five cupcakes sitting there left over from your granddaughter's birthday party and you can walk by 50 times and not touch them. But, your willpower will wear down and on that 51st time you will give in and you'll tell yourself, I'm just going to lick the frosting off the top. And then you're going to say, okay, well, I'm just going to go ahead and eat the whole cupcake. And then you're going to say, screw it. I already ruined my diet. I'm going to go ahead and just eat all of them. And that way they'll be gone. And I'll just start over tomorrow. I know the tricks because I've done it before. You can't let yourself even have that opportunity. We don't keep sugar in the house. Recovering sugar addicts do not keep sugar in the house. Recovering drug addicts don't keep drugs in their house. Come on. This is the same thing and we have to treat it like it's the same thing. The next thing you're going to want to do to deal with your emotional eating so you can lose weight is you've got to write down your why. You've got to have a strong why. We like to say, have a why that makes you cry. Why are you doing this? Why are you wanting to get your health under control? Why are you wanting to lose weight? It has to be something deep. It can't be to make your boyfriend's ex-girlfriend jealous. It can't be to just cause I want to feel better. It's gotta be something more detailed. It's gotta be something that is granular. Get granular with it. Write it down with a pen and paper and stick it on your refrigerator door, your bathroom mirror, or your car dashboard. That way you're always seeing and reminding yourself what your why is. Have an accountability system. Look, if you're an emotional eater and you're trying to overcome that so you can lose weight, you gotta have accountability. Accountability is the missing component in most programs. And I'm not talking about an accountability partner like your husband. Listen, are you serious? You think that man is crazy? You think he's really going to say something that you put something in your mouth and it doesn't belong there? Hey, yo, Karen, don't eat that. He knows he's, he doesn't want to get involved. No way. Your husband's not in a good accountability partner and neither is your sister because she loves you no matter what. You're going to call her up and say, yo, sis, 
I'm binge watching Game of Thrones with a big bowl of popcorn balanced on my chest and washing it down with a Diet Coke. She's gonna laugh and say, yeah, me too, sis. Your accountability system has got to be something that is strong and it's gotta be rooted in something that's gonna maybe cause a little bit of fear, or a little bit of respect. It's gotta be something that is proven to work. And you've gotta have a non-food reward system. When you reach those milestones, and it doesn't have to be a milestone, doesn't have to be weight loss. Your milestone could be just to get through your friend's baby shower without going face down in the candy table. And if you get through that and you pass with flying colors, what are you going to do for yourself? Are you going to go buy yourself a new pair of shoes? You need to have a non-food reward system in place. We don't use food to reward ourselves. We don't use food to punish ourselves. Food is fuel. One of the biggest problems I have with Weight Watchers is the fact that on Fridays when they all meet for their weigh-in down at the church potluck center or the armory, they all weigh in and they're like, woo, let's go out for Mexican. What? We just worked hard to lose three pounds this week and now you're going to put it right back on by food? No. You got to have a non-food reward system in place, a massage, a pedicure, whatever is going to make you happy. Like I mentioned, we have a What's Eating You course. And that course is designed to get you through your emotional eating. I'll link it up below. It's fantastic. Check that out if you need some extra help with emotional eating. But on our 10 pound takedown challenge, we talk a lot about mindset like this. So our next challenge is coming up soon. We have them every month. So if you missed the last one, don't worry. You can lose at least 10 pounds in 30 days by following a very, very simple, but proven procedure and system. Click the link below to join our next challenge and I will see you on the next video.